everyone. It's Janice, host of the Divorcing Religion podcast. Thanks for tuning into my show, whether you're joining me on audio or video. I've heard from some folks recently who have told me just how much the show has meant, and some of them have even found it not only to be life-changing, but life-saving, as they felt there was no one else who understood what they were going through, and they found the Divorcing Religion podcast, and they started feeling encouraged. Please help me keep my show on the air. Become a member by clicking the join button on the Conference on Religious Trauma YouTube channel. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Divorcing Religion Podcast. I'm your host, Janice Selby. I'm a registered professional counselor and a religious trauma recovery coach. I am so excited to share today's guest with you. She has previously appeared on the Dr. Phil Show, Jimmy Kimmel, ABC, CBS, and today she is a guest on the Divorcing Religion podcast. I'm talking about pleasure coach Nicole Mitchell. Raised in the evangelical Christian tradition, Nicole understood the role assigned to her within that tradition. A homemaker who was subservient to her husband and all men, in a monogamous heterosexual marriage. Traveling and learning about other religions allowed Nicole to embrace a more liberal form of Christianity, even becoming a pastor. While she was relieved not to be stuck in the toxic rigidity of faith that she was raised in, her parents and siblings viewed her new position as an abomination. While attending seminary in 2017, Nicole began letting go of religion altogether. She graduated with her master's in 2019, left her church, and moved with her husband and three kids to California, looking for a fresh start. In California, she began acting, modeling, and making erotic content on OnlyFans. Being an OnlyFans creator allowed Nicole to explore her sexuality, and she came out as queer. Today, Nicole Mitchell is a divorced mother of three, living as a queer woman. Not only does she have a thriving career as an OnlyFans creator, but she also empowers other women through her coaching practice. You can learn more about what she has to offer at NicoleMitchell.com, and that's Nicole spelled with a K. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited about this conversation, Janice. I'm introducing you to Canada because I'm in British Columbia. <laughs> I love Canada. So Perfect. Oh, yes. I'm so glad. Me too. Um, your story really stood out to me the first time that I, uh, maybe I ran into you on Instagram somewhere, or I might even have just heard somebody else talking about you because the the direction that you've taken your life the things you've walked through and the liberty, the freedom you have been able to give yourself is just beautiful. You have just been able to blossom like a beautiful, fragrant um, flower. And now you're helping other people, other women too, to do the same. So yes. thank you for what you do. Oh my gosh, Anna, thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity to share more of my story because it's it's a beautiful thing to go viral. You know, when I went viral as a pastor and stripper, it, it gets your foot in the door, but it also kind of like flattens you to a one-dimensional character and it doesn't provide the nuance and like the, the background to that story. And like, I think when I went viral, people think this was easy and like, and it wasn't. <laughs> It was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made to really no longer trust outside voices, outside authority, outside opinion, and only trust my intuition, my inner guidance, what my body was telling me. And as we all know, it's turned out to be the most beautiful decision I've ever made, but there were definitely bumps along the way. So I'm really grateful for platforms like this for, you know, to shed a little bit more light on that journey. Yeah. And, and there were costs also. We make decisions and then, uh, you know, we, we have to weigh out uh, beforehand. And sometimes we don't even have a complete grasp of what the costs might be. Um, but you were kind of, you were already growing and evolving. You had essentially outgrown uh, the beliefs, the very rigid beliefs that you were raised in. So I wonder if you would talk with us a little bit about what growing up was like for you. Yes, I totally bought into the indoctrination that I grew up with. Hook, line, and sinker all the way. I was the poster child for purity culture. I was a hardcore evangelist all four years of Bible college. I did not go on a single date. Like I was committed to Jesus and to purity and 
trying to be the good girl I was told and trained and indoctrinated to be. And I fulfilled the script I was told to fulfill, which is to grow up, marry a man and have his children. So I did that. I married a man. I had three children. I became a stay-at-home mother and I was miserable. No one told me that. I was told this would be the pinnacle of my fulfillment, that this was the, the whole point of my existence. And now here I am and I'm miserable. And I began to reflect and reevaluate my life. And then I came out as queer. I realized my queerness in my mid thirties. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. If I don't even know my own sexuality, what else do I think I completely know that I'm completely wrong about? And so that really began, that that was a catalyst for me to to leave everything and say, who is Nicole apart from the indoctrination? Who is Nicole apart from the dogma? Who is Nicole apart from everyone else's opinion on what is right and wrong? And like, what is Nicole's right and wrong? What is Nicole desire? What do I want? And it was scary. It's scary to leave everything you know. But I really felt like Elsa back then where she's like, let it go. I'm <laughs> leaving that life. I'm following that whisper. Even though this whisper sounds like it's going to lead me to my death. I was told it will lead me to my death. And I went into the great unknown and that's where I found new life, right? But it was a two-year journey of leaving and kind of unbecoming, unlearning, like kind of detoxifying from everything that had just been jammed to me from birth. And now it's led to this massively beautiful life. Wow. Wow. That is such an incredible um, journey. And all the more interesting and challenging, uh, not just because of the conditioning you had to unpick around religion, religious indoctrination and purity culture nonsense, uh, but because you were also a wife and a mother at the time that you were going through these um, changes. What what was that like? Because that just, yes. I, I think of my own deconversion and, and my, I still had kids at home too. And I say it was like holding a beach ball underwater for too long and that pressure, pressure is building and building. And then it comes up and it's so messy. And my deconversion was messy and it got mm -hmm. all over lots of people that I loved a lot and never mm -hmm. wanted to hurt. Um, but that's the way my deconversion went. So I, I'm curious about uh, yours. Yeah, it was scary. And I love that analogy you gave because when that beach ball came up and sprayed everyone around, around it, people get mad. Like, how dare you do this to me? How dare it be so messy? When I wish they would frame it a different way of like, if it's that messy, can you imagine how hard I've been holding this down? If it was this big of an explosion, this big of a transformation, can you even imagine the strength I had to try for as long as I did to keep that at bay? Like, I wish they would see it less as a personal attack and more of like, it's a strength I'm not necessarily proud of. Like I was, we were that repressed and suppressed. Like we did everything in our power to keep it down that the, the size of the mess is the size of our strength that we tried for as long as we did to hold it at bay. And so I, I wish people would see that that side of that deconversion journey. But it, I think it's a lot scarier when you have kids because now you're not just responsible for you. You're responsible for these wee little things that or however old they are. And, you know, when I was raising my children, I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought raising them in the faith and taking them to church and believing in all these different things was the right thing. And then I had this day of reckoning where I no longer believed any of it. And all of a sudden I felt, oh my God, I don't want my kids believing any of this, right? And I remember when I pulled them out of church, I had a lot of guilt and a lot of fear because that was their community. Those were their friends. That was our, our ritual, our tradition in our home. And you were married too. And I was married and like... It, it, it's just so scary because you're, it almost feels like the entire family weighs on your decision. And we, when you're deconverting or just kind of coming home to yourself, you're not quite sure what the right decision even is. We're guessing. We There's no road mapped out for us. We're carving the road with each step we take, but there's this immense pressure from ourselves, from our families, from strangers with opinions that we have to nail it just right. There is no nailing it. It is messy because we're finding our footing for the first time ever without all the crutches and beliefs and dogmas that's been holding us up. And so we are going to stumble and we're going to trip. And like, I, I, I really want whoever's listening to this to give yourself so much grace 
uh, in your journey. There is no such thing as nailing it. There is no such thing as getting 100% right. Like all that matters is that you keep putting one foot from the other. And I really believe as long as you don't stop, it will lead you all the way home. So giving yourself, um, giving yourself permission to explore your doubts, even though it feels so uncomfortable because we are uh, told that it's a sin, essentially. I mean, you don't want to be a doubting Thomas. Um, but, but when we do have those doubts, that's the time to really lean into them because we don't want to end up stuck in a belief system that is just, uh, untrue or yes. harmful. I mean, the truth needs to be, um, found out as scary as it is. And I, you know, as a pleasure quotes, I it, really, my job came as a result of my embodiment, my own journey, right? And I found that our pleasure is directly correlated to our profit, to our power, and to our peace. And so the more I follow my pleasure, the more alive I feel, the more magnetic I become, the more money I make, the more opportunities I attract. And so for me, when I realize I can either stay where I am and suppress that, which is really my magic, my magnetism, my ability to manifest and attract anything I want, suppress that to appease everyone around me to stay who I, who they need me to be, or I can have the courage to be who I came here to be and leverage that power I have within myself to build a really beautiful life. And so I made that choice where the risk of disappointing others was was I'd rather disappoint others and stop disappointing myself mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, I'm the only person I go to bed with that I need to be, make peace with. And if I don't have peace about who I am and what I'm doing with my life, then what's the point? But if I can go to bed with peace in my heart and a smile on my face, I am living my truthiest truth. I'm being fully aligned and integrity with who I came here to be. That can never be taken from me, even if you disagree with me. Wow, that's so true and so powerful. There's there's exactly one person at any given moment that that we know we can uh, make happy or please, and that's that's ourselves. But when we're trained, especially, I feel like those um, who grow up in the church, assigned female at birth, um, just feeling like our calling. Oh, I got my air quotes going. Is to serve. That's it. That's what we're allowed to do. We're not to teach. We can teach children. We can do Sunday school stuff. But uh, and maybe you know we can be on worship team, but we can't really actually lead the worship team. So there, there are all these uh, things that we're not allowed to do. And I even remember my own mom modeling this for me, and she must have told me at some point, "You're never to outshine your husband." Like those oh. words, "You're never to outshine your husband." And so along the way. When I was first married, um, I gave up guitar because he liked playing guitar. I stopped writing because he was going to be the writer. Like all these, all these things, and then things that I did to try and oh, just always support him and his goals and elevate him, and so that other people would, you know, look at him and praise him. Uh, and I think eventually I got pretty sick of it, and and I tried to dull my sparkle, dim my light, whatever you want to say, you know, make myself as, as small as possible. Um, and then I just couldn't do it anymore. It just didn't make sense. And I thought, like you, I've got gifts. Why can't I be using my um, gifts? I'm good with people. I like doing these different things. But in the context of uh, my religious training, I didn't see how it was possible. Mm, wow. You and I are very similar in that way, which is so interesting because I have a partner now and his favorite thing in the world, one of his favorite things in the world is to make me shine. And it feels so good to have a partner because, and he'll tell me, he's like, you come alive when you're the center of attention. He's like, when the light is on you, he's like, you radiate like I've never seen someone radiate. So he loves to push me into the limelight. He loves making sure I'm seen and appreciated and recognized. And it's so the opposite of what you and I were raised with because I was taught the exact same thing. It's all about the men. And it's interesting, even as a little girl, I noticed in my churches, and I went to many churches growing up, not a single woman in leadership. All the women were in the nursery or in the kitchen. So without even them having to explicitly say, you belong in the kitchen or you belong with the children, I picked up on it. 
I, I, I absorbed that message so early, so quickly and, and interpret it as truth. Oh, this is where women belong. Right. And it wasn't until after I got divorced, that's when my income blew up. And I realized because I held myself back to be the good wife. But when I no longer had someone I had to run all my decisions by, or I didn't live with this idea that I can't shine brighter, everything exploded in my life for the better. So again, this indoctrination harms everyone. It puts a lot of pressure on the men, even for your husband, for him, like he has to be good at writing and, and guitar. Like he, like it puts so much pressure on him. It takes away the power of the woman. Everyone loses in this way of life. And what I really believe when you live your truth and I live my truth and they live their truth, everybody wins, even when it's temporarily uncomfortable. Wow. Yeah. I think that's so true. And even though <clears throat> divorce, you know, is often painful and it was painful for us, partly because we really cared about each other. Um, but the friendship that was able to grow between us after the divorce, when he no longer had the pressure uh, of being, you know, my husband, and I no longer felt the demands of being his wife, then we could actually just relate as humans and support each other as friends and co-parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's been wonderful. And now I also have a partner who's very uh, encouraging of, of my efforts. And um, something else I think we have in common too is the element of um, queerness in our stories as well. So becoming, giving myself permission finally to explore that. And I mean, I was like, was I in my 40s by that time? I mean, I was late to the party, uh, but I knew I just couldn't, I couldn't hide that uh, part of myself anymore. And the funny thing is, <laughs> then when I told my ex-husband, because it was just before the marriage ended, and I said, I think I'm, I'm actually really attracted to women and I, I really want to pursue that relationally. And he's like, is that is this a surprise to you? He says it's not a surprise to me. We've been married for <laughs> for almost twenty years, and uh, and I thought that was really funny actually because I had tried super hard to um <laughs> to not have that aspect of me show up, but you know what are you gonna do? It's it's me. It's who I am, and uh, and my husband that I'm married to now is uh, a man. And several years my senior, 22 years uh, older than me. Mm -hmm. And I never thought, I never imagined myself uh, mm -hmm. in a relationship with that dynamic. And it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful romantic relationship I've ever had. <laughs> I love that. Like, I I think, you know, sometimes I think about this because when I got divorced, it same, it was very messy, it was very unexpected, very scary. And at the time I would have told you it's the worst thing to ever happen to me. Now that I'm on the other side, I can absolutely say truthfully, it was one of the best things to happen to me. But I think about when we fall in love again, how lucky are we? Like, I really don't paint my ex as a bad guy. He's a good guy, but it was, a, it was a love that was complete and it needed to be released. And sometimes I think the greatest expression of love is the willingness to let someone go. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing when you can find love in life, but when you can find love more than once, right? And then you can find in love with, fall in love with the, the right person for this new chapter in your life. Like it's such a beautiful thing. So there's a lot of stigma to divorce, a lot of stigma with remarrying or dating or falling in love with again, a lot of assumptions and judgment that come with that second, third, fourth relationship. And I wish people viewed it the opposite. When I found out Pamela Anderson has, which if you've not watched her documentary for everyone who's listening to this, you need to watch her documentary. I think it's on Netflix. It is so good. And again, it gave her a platform for her to finally tell her truth and not have media gossip and try to tell you a different story. I was shocked at what I learned about her in the most beautiful way. She's the most beautiful woman. But when I found out she's been married, I believe, five times, I thought, how lucky is she that she has fallen in love that many times and she's given herself permission to fall in love and marry whoever, whenever, despite what anyone says about her. Like, I want to be that kind of woman like so free, free to love, free to marry, free to divorce, free to do whatever is my truth, whatever feels right for me. And yes, there's stigma because I think we don't know how to handle woman in our power. We don't know to do with a woman when she says, this is not working for me anymore. 
I will not tolerate this anymore. Yes, I want to fall in love with you. Yes, let's do this thing called life together. Like, what do you do with a woman who's that certain and moves forward in that kind of courage? She's unstoppable. And when you're in a patriarchy, you don't want unstoppable women. You want stoppable women. So the more you can shame and stigmatize a woman in any decision she makes, a woman is shamed if she remains childless. A woman is shamed if she has children and works a job. A woman is shamed if she gets divorced. Like, no matter what a woman does, she's shamed because it's a great way to keep an entire gender under control. So whenever someone tells me I'm out of control, I'm like, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because you're right. I am not controlled by anyone or anything. I am a free woman. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That is so powerful. That is just a beautiful um, picture to me. A woman in her power. And you are right. The patriarchy can't have that because patriarchy won't survive uh, yeah. when women um, step into their rightful positions of power and authority in their own lives so it's even though it's terrifying what we see going on in the united states right now um it's in some ways it's also exciting because you know that change is happening um and i think women are not going to be silent and people who love uh women are not going to be silent but it's change is scary change feels scary because it's Mm -hmm. uncertain we're not sure how things will go so that's that's deeply powerful um and you were married. I'm I'm thinking back to a Business Insider interview that you gave. Um, so I read that article. It was a great article. And uh, you talked about, um, at the time, you were married to your former husband. And so he kind of came on that journey with you as you were deconverting and then um, dipping your toes into the OnlyFans um, world. And that's such a huge leap going from being a a church going bible believing uh you know wife and mother to showing what you've got really putting yourself out there in a very sexual way to people who aren't your husband so what was that um transition like how did you guys cope with that how about your kids like are they do they know what you do Uh, maybe your kids are older now I'm, i'm not sure Yeah. So my husband was really supportive my whole time to him. Like he always saw my power and would always encourage me to go further and like really follow my intuition, which I've always greatly admired and respected about him and still very grateful to him for that. And so I did. And I just don't think he realized how far I would go. Um, And I think he blamed himself for a while that maybe he was too supportive. But even if he hadn't supported me, I still would have gone all the way because this is who I am. Right. So, but he was a huge reason for my growth from my very indoctrinated upbringing. He's always been more open minded, more liberal, nowhere near as legalistic the way I was raised. And then we kind of flipped. Like he was always over here. I always joked him, he was my gateway drug to all things liberal. He's here and I'm, I'm here. And I thought I was moving closer to him because I'm becoming more and more open and completely changing my mindset around everything. But we end up doing this. We ended up crisscrossing. So he went from very liberal to very conservative. I went from very conservative to very liberal. And we totally changed places, which people, I got a lot of grief on the internet for changing so much, but so did my ex-husband. And as much as we became opposite people, and it's one of the reasons, the main reason our marriage ended, it we're all evolving. Like While he doesn't necessarily love everything I do, and I don't necessarily love everything he does, I love that we're both evolving. I love that we didn't get stuck and try to stay the same person we once were, that we're just trusting our own evolution, even when it's something as scary as becoming very different than what we thought we originally were going to be. So then I, after my marriage ended, I still had to make the hard decision. Do I keep trusting myself and my path? Because right now it looks like my path is taking everything from me. I'm losing my husband. I lost my entire family. My parents and my siblings all cut me off. I lost all three of my best friends because it was too much for them. Like it Mm. was brutally painful. And people thought that was enough evidence to say, see, you're making the wrong decision. But in my heart, I just knew it was still the right decision. And I just had to choose, am I still going to trust my unfolding and still trust this journey? And I chose to trust while crying a lot of tears. And now I'm on the other side. And what's so interesting is I feel the most holy, the most connected to God, universe, whatever it is, when I'm naked, 
I'm literally fulfilling God's original plan, which is naked and unashamed. And so when you came into the world. Literally. (laughs) And it is the thing that Christians shame me the most is God's original command to be naked and unashamed. And I think that's part of what is so triggering is I can literally be naked and I feel zero shame and they don't know what to do with that. Because again, that's a woman in her power. And I always think, why should I be ashamed of what I've been given? Why should I be ashamed of this temple I live in? Like, how is this not the most beautiful thing to share with the world? Because it's not even just my, my physical body. It's about the energy. I exude shamelessness. I exude joy. I exude pleasure. So when someone experiences me in my naked form, whether it's in person or online, there's a lot of healing that happens, right? And I think that's why my OnlyFans has done so well. Yes, it's scandalous going from pastor turned stripper. But once they join, I've had so many men say, you duped me. I thought I was coming for the hot girl shit. I didn't know I was gonna have my life changed for the better as a result. And like wow. they they start absorbing the same shameless mar- uh energy into their marriage, into their lives, into their, into their relationships. And like, if that is not the original commandment that, that love itself gave us to live free and unashamed, I don't know what is. Mm, that is so beautiful and so powerful. I think it's really just so cool that, um, that people interact with you on your channel that way as well, that it, it makes changes for them. Like that's, that's just fantastic. So what about um, the kids then? Well, for, first I'm thinking, boy, how does that go sharing kids back and forth when one's super religious and one is uh, is really living in quite a free way? Um, how, do, how do you manage that? And then what do you tell uh, the kids about your yeah, work? You know, it used to really bother me because they are being raised in two very different homes. But something that I've made peace with is at least this way, they can't be indoctrinated. They're being exposed to very different beliefs, very different ways of living. And they now have the freedom to choose the parts they love best and the parts that they don't want. And I'm like actually really happy for them in that way. So they do know at all the different levels. My kids are 8, 11, and 13. I have two bonus kids, 15 and 17. They all know I have an account. They know that I do modeling. Um, and my kids have had different seasons. They've had seasons of ew, gross, why? Um, and I tell them, you know, kids do kids things and grownups do grown up things. And we have the conversation about consent and bodily autonomy and self-expression. And now they've moved more into more of a respectful season because they've seen what I've been able to provide for them as a single mom, right? I still live on my own with my kids. I don't live with my partner. So I still provide full time for my children. And I just found out like a week ago, my daughter has me in her phone as millionaire mama. And I love like (laughs) pride in that, right? Like she knows what I do. And there's this pride of like, I see the results of what my mom gets and what that does for us. And so they're in a season of like being in really awe and respect of my career. And that's pretty incredible. Wow. Yes. And because they see that you actually enjoy what you do very much. Um, you feel like it's an important, uh, it's important to you to be able to be yourself, to be free. Um, do we need to take a break? Do you need to deal with someone in your vicinity there? I think he's good. It's my little, my, my youngest who needs help with his video gaming. I'm like, just give me a minute. I will help you. When I'm with this. True mother. Oh like this is it right here, right? This is not. And here's, I want to say about this. Something else I love about my career, Janice, because you're getting a real inside glimpse is not only do I live in California, which is one of the most expensive states in the world. And not only do I solely provide for all three of my children, but my, he's homesick today from school. And this is part of why I chose the career I did. I want to be home for my children. I want to be present for my children. So there's a lot of pride in that where I chose a career that's not only based on my pleasure, but it's based on what's good for my family. And so I just am so grateful. I used to be a high school teacher, right? So I know what the eternal grind is. Teachers work so hard and such long hours. And I remember thinking, this can't be my forever job. I value being home. I value being present. I value modeling for my kids another way of doing business, another way of making money, another way of doing family. And so 
as much as I don't love him coming to my interview because he knows he's not supposed to, I love that I'm home with him on a sick day and I don't have to take off work or miss some important thing because I get to work from home full time. Wow, that's so fantastic. You really make a good uh, a good case <laughs> for yeah. for doing the work that you do. Um, I'm wondering when it comes to your kids then, so you were raised really steeped in purity culture and you are, I'm assuming, raising your kids to be very sex positive. That's something that a lot of uh, parents who've come out of purity culture really struggle with and they wonder how can they do that? Like they're, cause they feel like they've been, their mindset has been so hijacked or, or tainted, whatever you want to call it, by the purity culture indoctrination. Yes. They don't want to pass that on uh, to their kids. But we live in a time where our children definitely have to have knowledge about consent, about their bodies, uh, about what's, you know, acceptable um, for as far as anyone trying to get, get them to engage in a way if they're not interested um, or even about safety uh, over the internet because predators abound. That's It's a fantastic place, the internet, and it also can be a kind of a pretty scary place. So how, mm -hmm. how do you juggle that? I mean, your older two, your stepkids are in their later teens, but mm -hmm. your younger three, you know, they're coming to the point where that kind of talk is going to be really important. Yeah, it's really hard when you're a purity culture survivor because we only know what we know. And so I do really value hiring a therapist, a counselor, a life coach who specializes, especially in like kind of unlearning and deconverting from an old way of belief, old cultural values of your family or society or religion. So I think really having a safe space for you to work through your issues so you don't project those onto your children, right? Like it's really important for me to let my children be them, not who I was told to be or afraid of who they might be, right? So we talk a lot about sex, consent, age-appropriate things with my children. We have a very open home, which is really amazing because I didn't learn about consent until five years into my marriage. I had no clue that was a thing. And when I learned what it was, I was horrified that I could be a full-grown adult and not even know consent. And so my kids have known since age two. Right. And I remember when my kid was like five and six years old, my youngest. And if we're going through the door, I put my hand back. Like, oh, we got to go. He's like, don't touch my body without my consent. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, son, I see you. You are right. I'm sorry. I touched your body without consent. Like they locked that in at such a young age. And I'm so glad that they know what it is. And they can even speak to an authority figure, their own parent. Like, don't touch me unless I give you consent. I'm like, you're 100% right. I will not do that again. Like, I'm so sorry. So like Amazing. just even those small things. And um, I also normalize STIs. There's a lot of stigma around STIs. And I, I teach my children, like, if you're going to have sex, STIs comes with it. It just is. It's just like, you want to go out in the world to be a human? You're going to get colds. You're going to get the flu. You're going to get infections. It doesn't mean you're doing anything bad. You're just having a human experience. Same thing with sex. When you get an STI, it's a when not typically an if, when you get an essay, you didn't do anything bad. It's just part of being a sexual being. So we do things to lessen our chances of risk. We wash our hands. We try not to get the cold. We we stay home if we have a flare-up of a cold. Same thing with STIs. We use barriers. We use protection. We abstain if we have a flare-up happening. Like It is no different. It's just the stigma we have to work through. So I try to teach my kids, like when it comes to STIs specifically, all STIs are curable or manageable. So there is no ST that you can get that will absolutely ruin your life for the rest of it. We have the medication, we have the pills, we have what we need today to thrive as a sexual being. So even just having that realization, because I think people have so much fear and ignorance around STIs, I don't think most people know that all STIs are curable or manageable. When you know that, then you can make an informed decision, is me having an active sex life worth the risk of a manageable or curable disease? or infection, you know, and I've made the wow. choice that yes, it's worth it for me. And then we talk about protection and we talk about consent and we talk about power dynamics. And my kids probably get annoyed sometimes like, <laughs> mom, oh my God, you've already told us this, but I love that that's their reactions. Like you've already told us about consent. You've already told us to never do, never make anyone do anything or you should never be made to do anything. Like but it's because I wasn't given that. So I, I want them to be fully armed with their options. And I try not to place unrealistic expectations. Like 
you will not have sex as a teenager. Chances are they're going to have sex as a teenager. So if I'm going to go in assuming they're going to have sex as a teen, what do I want them to know to be prepared for that rather than me finding out later and wishing I'd better prepare them? Wow. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for, um, for normalizing uh, STIs because that's a topic that we just don't hear about. And I think it's super important. And it is, like you say, it's just a, it's a part of the game. It's a fact of life. Nothing uh, shameful about it. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> you, you as a parent, it reminds me of this cartoon I saw. These two little boys are playing cars and the one kid says to the other, uh, my mom found a condom under the veranda. And the other kid says, what's a veranda? <laughs> <laughs> Not, yes, that's that's the the way we want this generation to be moving. That we're we're uh, removing the stigma um, and you know some of the mystery and being a being a young person, being a child, and then a teenager. Really, your body your your body's changing so much. Your your mind is changing. Your job at that time is to be learning about yes. about your your body changing and the different feelings you're having you're attracted to certain people or to all sorts of people uh and so you're learning what it feels like to be you in your body and part of the way we learn is by experimenting by trying things so you're giving your kids such wonderful information for when they do experience that curiosity and then they know whatever happens they can come to you and they're not going to be judged you'll you'll tell them factually uh, and you'll receive them compassionately as a as a mother would um so i just think that's so powerful you sound like a wonderful mother oh thank you i'm very great i feel very grateful that i learned this while i still had them like because I know a lot of us, you and I were later in life and my kids could have been out of the house when I learned all this. And like, that would have been a different journey for me, but I'm very grateful. They've seen the evolution and they have lots of questions because they're like, they, they remember going to church and they know we don't, we don't go anymore. They remember when I used to pray, I don't pray anymore. And like, even just yesterday, my youngest goes, you're a Christian mom. Cause he saw a folder in my Gmail called church stuff from like many years ago. I go, Oh, that's from years ago, honey, when I used to preach, but I don't do that anymore. And he's like, Oh, okay. You know, and just like, and kind of what you and I were talking about earlier is like this permission to evolve. And that's what I want women to know listening and any gender who's listening, but you're allowed to reinvent yourself at any moment. You are not required to stay the same version of yourself for any reason. You can reinvent yourself at any moment. You can reinvent yourself as many times as you want. Like I remember reading this article called The Top 10 Regrets of the Dying. And one of the top 10 was they wish they had lived a life truer to who they really were instead of being who everyone else needed them to be. And when I read that, I was like, that will not be on my regret list when I'm old. I'm going to be me all the way. And if that means I have to reinvent myself many times over, I will reinvent myself many times over. So I'm really grateful that my kids have seen this journey. While it's been probably a little confusing at different times, I love they they're learning just by absorbing. They too are allowed to change. At any time something doesn't feel right, you're allowed to shift and make it feel better. Wow. Yeah. There's this, uh, this quote that I really like, um, you are one decision away from a completely different life. And it's true. I think that really speaks to the power that each of us has. And, um, people are so, they can be so scared of what other people think and Mm -hmm. so terrified of how others might react to their, um, decisions. And this is something I go over with my religious trauma clients, the whole idea of, um, staying in our lane. And the minute we are attempting to manage someone else's uh, thoughts, behaviors, reactions, we are veering into their lane. And that's actually not where we belong. And it's not our job. So we don't have to, we don't have to do that. We can be confident in our own decision-making abilities and following our intuition. Uh, we can do research and contact people who know more than we do. We're allowed to make our decisions and live the life that feels right to us that we want to live and you know frankly people will adjust they're either going to adjust and stay in your life or they'll adjust by by leaving your life and even though that's painful it can also angry is the b word it can be a blessing sometimes you know we're blessed by uh other people sometimes by their presence and sometimes by their absence it's just true amen 
Amen. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite quotes by Glennon Doyle is impose yourself on the world. The world will adjust. Oh, that is so good. Um, we we have uh, still about 15 minutes left. I wonder, would you share with us um, about uh, the work that you do and even how you got into it? I mean, if, what if I've never gone on uh, OnlyFans, so I don't know. I imagine there's everything, p- p- things on there to suit every desire or interest uh, that people have. Um, mm-hmm. Are and I look at you and you're so beautiful. And I think, well, is there space for someone who's older, someone who has a few extra pounds, someone who doesn't just, you know, fit kind of the social media mold of what's uh, perfectly um, perfect? This is what I love about today, modern day, is, and what I love about modeling, what I love about platforms like OnlyFans is it's democratized it, right? Before there's agencies with a very tight bottleneck, you have to be a certain height, certain weight, certain age, you didn't make that cut, you're thrown out with the trash. Now we hold the power. We have the social media platforms. We manage our own accounts. And there is such a hunger for authenticity that there are literally models of every age, every body type, Every size you can imagine. There are very successful only uh, OnlyFans creators who are gilfs, not milfs, gilfs, grandmas, <laughs> right? Yeah. Grandma's doing their thing. There's another mom I follow. She's in her late fifties, right? Has extra pounds, has all the cellulite. And she, and she and I had this conversation online how that's actually the very thing our fans love the most. They love the realness. They love the squishiness. Like even me, like you see, like I'm very intentional how I pose for my photos. But like when you see me, like my latest interview on my Instagram, I'm sitting and there's rolls on my stomach. Like that's just real life. And I don't try to hide that because like I'm a real person. I've had three kids. Like my skin's not the same as when I was 20 and not pregnant. Like, you know, and like I I found shockingly enough, that's what subscribers love the most because they can get the perfectly curated photos from a magazine from Instagram. But what do you like behind the curtain? What do you like in real life? And that's what my fans love on my OnlyFans. And the cool thing too is like, I think part of why my OnlyFans has done really well is it's been a real-time evolution. When I first started, I was very shy, very bashful, very modest. I showed nothing. I wore clothing or I covered every all the special parts. Like everything, <laughs> I was too scared. I had to be one photo every few days, right? And it slowly evolved into I felt more and more comfortable. I felt a little less shame. I felt more and more free. And now I'm like all the way out there. I make all kinds of explicit content which my fans love, but they also love my cute stuff. They love when I'm silly. They love when I'm goofy. They love when I'm being a parent. Like a lot of my subscribers send gifts to my kids. They like they my I have an Amazon wish list. My kids know if they put something on there that they want, my fans will buy it for them. Amazing. When we took our kids to Disney World last year, one of my fans sent me four hundred dollars cash. Please buy your kids something with this while you're at Disney World. Like. They love that I'm a mom and they ask questions about how my kids are doing. They send me baking kits so my kids and I can bake and make memories in the kitchen together. Like I feel like they're they're almost like fellow parents for my children that they they just love on my kids and give to them and support them. And they know as a single mom, they really want me to feel supported and not alone. Like it's a very sacred space. So I say, yes, whatever age you are, whatever size you are, whatever stage of life you're in, there is an audience for it. Because at the end of the day, what people care about most is authenticity. Wow. That's, I mean, my mind is blown. That sounds like such generosity, um, like really true uh, generosity from people who appreciate you and your work. So uh, for someone who's never gone on OnlyFans, does that mean you turn your camera on for three hours of the day and you just film yourself throughout the day doing everything you're doing? Or it's different for every every creator has their own every way of creator's doing it. Different. Every creator mm-hmm. has their own style. So for me, I post at least every day, maybe multiple, sometimes multiple times a day because it's my favorite platform to be on because it's not just a place for my self-expression. I've built a thriving community on there. Like, mostly men. I have some couples and I have some women and some queer folk. My couples are actually my favorite. I learned through OnlyFans, I have a couple's kink. So when I have couples subscribe, I like melt into the floor with happiness. Um, And I post like series of photos every day. 
I do two live streams every week. I do one big live stream at the end of every month where I pref- I dance, I sing, I strip. It's a whole, like if you came to the Nicole Mitchell show, it's on my OnlyFans, they're three hours long. Like I do these fun games every single month to be creative. So, that, you know, because you don't want it to get redundant. You want your place to be spicy and fun and cute and creative. So I have a, a new game I create every single month. Um it's amazing. So yeah, I have a lot of women who subscribe just to see what it's like. And I will tell you this, I've been doing this for almost five years now. I've had tens of thousands of subscribers and I've had to maybe block five people. So one person a year, I am very respected. And on the rare occasion, I've gotten some gross comment or Nat's comment my fans come to my defense before I even read it. I don't even know. And I come and I see the next comment and I see all of their responses back to them. I'm like, oh, (laughs) I don't even need to say anything. My fans put them in their place. Like it is the exact opposite of what I was told it would happen. You're going to be degraded and no one's going to value you and you're going to be disrespected. You're going to be unsafe. My fans are so protective of my safety. If they see me, like I sometimes I have a PO box. People can send me mail and I get mail every single week for my fans. And I'll post my address, like a picture of it on social uh, social media. Like, look at this gift I got. And it shows my address. Nicole, 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 take your address out. And, like, don't let people, like they are the first to report it. And it's not even my home address. It's my PO box. I'm like, oh, it's okay. It's my PO box. They're like, okay, we just want to make sure you're safe. So protective of my safety, so respectful of my time. I remember I had surgery a few years ago and I was like, guys, I'm going to take a little break. I got to recover. And they said, don't you dare come back on here until you're recovered. You are not allowed to post until you're better. I'm like, like (laughs) such respectful humans. Amazing. And so uh, is this a part of the training that you give when people um, take your programs? Or please tell us uh, about the the work that you do coaching. I have all kinds of programs. So I do have an OnlyFans training that is really popular because I really teach how to do it very embodied and to, you, to not do anything you don't want to do. I do not ascribe that you have to do things you don't want to do to make a lot of money. I, I do not believe in that. So I have, a, I have a very popular OnlyFans training. I have a lot of people in general who come to me asking, how can I make more money? Because I was on food stamps for nine years and then I made seven figures in a year and a half. And like, I know how to make money. So I have um, like a, my signature money program, which is called Become a Money Magnet. My newest, most popular program right now is called Get Paid to Go on Dates. So I actually co-teach with a client of mine how to do luxury dating, where men will pay you to go on dates with them. Sex is not required. When I I discovered this, I was like, oh my gosh, how come I've not been doing this for the past 20 (laughs) years of my life? Like, get paid to go have lunch? Are you So that blew up and we had so many women sign up for that program. Our clients are getting such amazing results. Um, even just yesterday, I booked a lunch date for a thousand dollars next month in Texas. When I go there for work, they're going to pay for, a, for me to have lunch with them for a thousand dollars. Like, so I get a lot of people who want to learn how to date on their terms, how to make money on their terms and how to run an OnlyFans on their terms. Wow. You, you are using all of your uh, assets. So not just to say um, a beautiful body that I'm sure you also work hard to maintain, but your brain and figuring Mm -hmm. out all these things. I just love it. You're really uh, empowering other people. And that's a beautiful thing. Yes. I think as women, we have been indoctrinated to give everything away for free. Our time, our energy, our expertise, our gifts, and we shouldn't even be recognized for it. I remember being taught that like you, like you should get no recognition. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Like you should just do it silently and humbly. Right. And, um, and I learned like, wait, no wonder I'm on food stamps. <laughs> if I'm giving everything away for free and I don't know how to monetize and I don't know how to charge, how can I expect to make a lot of money? So when I started putting boundaries, like, Oh, I'm sorry. I used to do that for free, but now that's a fee. I got a lot of kickback. Who do you think you are to charge for that? Who do you think you are to make money doing that? Like, and I decided I'm Nicole fucking Mitchell. Like that's who I am. And like, I know the value of my body, my, the value of my energy. So at the end of the day, what I monetize is my energy. 
So whether I exude it and share it through OnlyFans, I exude it through my life coaching, I exude it over a lunch date, you're getting access to an energy that will make you feel like a million bucks by the time you're done with me. Whether we talk for five minutes or we hang out for five hours, I'm going to charge you for that. Right. And obviously there's exceptions. I obviously we all make exceptions, but as a whole, when I learned to monetize who I am, not just what I do, my income went through the roof. Wow. Wow. I I believe you're uh you must have fantastic content. I bet people get tremendous value for their money because I've just spent almost an hour with you and I feel like you're a cheerleader. You're just <laughs> encouraging me to go, go, go and be myself, be authentic, keep doing the things that I'm doing, and even to start getting comfortable with charging, uh, you know, perhaps uh, a better way than I have been charging because people in the helping professions that's a real problem for a lot of us. So I think I might be signing up for one of your courses. Thank you very I much. I would love to have you. <laughs> and you know, I, I got my master's in social justice. And what's interesting, because I care I care about radical transformation. I care about sustainability. I care about longevity of justice and equality and equity. And we could talk about all of that. But the one thing I was not allowed to talk about in my master's was money. When money is the number one thing you need to create change, you want to create massive change, you have to be loaded. It's and I, for better or for worse, you can hate me, but I'm just telling the truth. You want to make massive change, money is power in today's world for what, for better or for worse. And so I was passionate about getting rich. I was not okay to talk about getting rich. So I wasn't allowed to talk about it. And it was like killing me because I'm like, I know money is like typically the number one difference maker for everyone. And then when I graduated and I started making a lot of money, guests who started DMing me asking me for donations. The very people and organizations who said it is inappropriate for you to talk about money like that, but can we please have some? Wow. That's our problem. That's shame. Shame to talk about it little bit of shame to ask for it, but I'm still going to ask for it anyway. And I said, wouldn't it have been better for you to have learned how to create wealth like I did than to come and ask me for mine? You want to learn how? Here's my Become a Money Magnet course, right? And so I get that war when you're in the helping profession or you're in the social justice, even in queer spaces and queer, a lot of us are are poor and we identify as poor. We hate capitalism and we hate this, you know, the patriarchy. And when I, again, wanted to become rich, I had a lot of queer friends get mad at me for saying that because that they said, oh, you're, you're, you're buy-in, right? You're buying into capitalism. I'm like, or I'm just buying in that I deserve a quality of life that feels good to me. And it requires a certain amount of money to have a good quality of life. I'm going to go create it. And the last thing I'll say with this is I had two queer friends who really came after me on social media, like literally hate commenting on every single post. They were so mad that I was teaching how to get wealthy, calling me a sellout. I never engage. I'm like, they'll see the proof. I'm not engaging, but I'm not deleting. Like you can say whatever now, I delete and block all the time. But back then I was like, I have nothing to prove. Your hate comment just reveals who you are. Nothing about me. A year later, guess who hires me as their life coach? Those two people. Wow. So when your critics become clients... (laughs) you know your stuff works. And they said, I, we've been watching you and you've done it. You've done it even while we've been giving you crap. We need to know your secret. Wow. Oh my gosh. I love your uh, integrity. That really, and that just goes in line with uh, autis- authenticity and being your authentic self. How can people find you? Where can people find you? Yes, please come say hi to me. I'm on all the socials. Um, you can go to my website, NicoleMitchell.com, N-I-K-O-L-E. Um, I'm the most active on OnlyFans, Instagram, and Facebook. Right. And I think on Instagram, it's Mitchell Nicole. Yes. Yeah, that's it. This has been such a delightful conversation. I hope that I get to uh, talk with you again. And you're really getting me amped up thinking about the Shameless Sexuality Conference that I'm hosting in Seattle next year. These things we've talked about today uh, are really important topics. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. Okay, everyone, thanks for tuning in. If you're looking for uh, one-on-one therapy, please go to my website divorcing-religion.com and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.